Welcome to all of you and um, thank you for coming to our roundtable entitled Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Environmental Management on the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, this is part of a series of, event, of events on climate research on the Tibetan Plateau that is co-organized by the Modern Tibetan Studies Program and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University and also the Inner Asian and Uralic National Resource Center at Indiana University. Um, these events are made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, the Inner Asian and Uralic National Resource Center at Indiana University and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia University. Um, so these roundtables are meant to bring together social scientists working with Tibetan and Himalayan pastoralist communities and climate scientists who focus on Asia um, to discuss how interdisciplinary approaches might enrich understandings of climate change in Tibetan and Himalayan regions, and also contribute to our knowledge of global climate change and community resilience. So today we have um, uh, three panelists who will have um, each about 20 minutes to present their work. Um, we're going to hear first from uh, Purwa Gurung, uh, and then Dr. Hung Nguyen and hopefully uh, Dr. Pasangyanji Sherpa. Um, and after they present, um, I'll, I'll introduce each of them before they present. And after they present, uh, we will we will turn uh, we will we will turn to a discussion where the panelists will have a chance to ask each other questions. Um, and then we will open things up to the audience for questions and comments. So you can either save your questions until the end or send your questions to us at any time in the chat box. Um, so um, our first panelist is uh, Purwa Gurung. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, he's a political ecologist researching environmental governance, indigeneity, and the socio-environmental uh, state in the Himalaya. His publications include peer-reviewed articles on participatory conservation as state territorialization and dispossession in Dolpo. Um, and this is published in Environment and Planning E, Nature and Space. Um, he also has uh, a publication on development narratives and the political and economic geographies of road building in Humla in Geoforum, um, and also a co-authored chapter on development among pastoralists in Dolpo in the Routledge Handbook of Highland Asia. Um, he's going to talk to us today about indigenous environmental governance and the state. Um, so please, uh, please welcome Purwa. All right, thank you, uh, Evelyn, um, for the introduction uh, and greetings uh, from Kathmandu, which is where I'm zooming in from uh, right now. Um, as Emily uh, Evelyn mentioned, I'm a political ecologist and human geographer um, interested in environment society uh, relationships in the Himalaya. Uh, today, I'll be talking about my ongoing work that examines indigenous environmental governance and the state in the Himalayas, uh, Tolpo in particular. Uh, uh, before I proceed, I would like to thank Evelyn for and the organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, important and timely panel. Um, I am, uh, of course, honored to share this panel with Dr. Hung and Dr. Uh, Pasang Yangzi, um, and I look forward to the discussions um, later. Uh, trying to navigate this. Um, So I'll just uh, give a brief overview of my uh, research interests. Um, uh, my dissertation research uh, examines the relationship between biodiversity conservation, indigeneity, and more than human uh, geographies as they are called into question and illuminated by uh, the caterpillar fungus, which is an extremely high value natural resource that has brought unprecedented social economic uh, political and environmental transformations in, uh, in, in the Himalaya and the Tibetan Plateau, uh, where it is found. I draw on interdisciplinary fields of political ecology, indigenous geographies, and multi-species ethnography, or more than human geographies, um, uh, in, in, in this uh, project. Uh, political ecology allows me to examine the historical and political economic processes that underlie uh, state-led environmental management projects, specifically biodiversity conservation. So 
um, again, a disclaimer uh, that my work is not uh, directly about climate change per se, but uh, more about uh, biodiversity conservation, uh, which I, I argue to be a part of state uh, making and territorialization uh, project that is intertwined with uh, uh, national development imaginaries uh, and geopolitical security um, in the Himalayan borderlands. Indigenous geographies allow me to pay, to pay attention to the traditional and contemporary uh, knowledge and practices concerning local resource use and governance that are otherwise obscured uh, and displaced by hegemonic environmental management regimes of nation states. Uh, especially, I'm committed to documenting uh, the spatial dimensions of oral literature and traditional ecological knowledge, such as place-based narratives, um, origin myths, proverbs, and, uh, and common sayings, folk songs, uh, and tales um, uh, in, in my home region of Tolpo. Uh, this is an urgent project um, in the context of decreasing number of knowledge holders um, and, uh, and limited transmission to younger generations who are migrating to urban areas uh, for education and other uh, reasons. Um, so these um, um, uh, bodies of indigenous knowledge constitute um, a genre of local historiography that uh, provides important insights into cultural memories of place and landscape, identities of people, resource use and governance practices, territoriality, plant and animal ecologies, um, as well as the ethical moral codes concerning the relationship between humans um, and the non-human world. Uh, finally, I also draw on multi-species ethnography and more than human geographies that are attentive to uh, the agency and life of non-humans as they are entangled with uh, and affect human lives and constitute sociality. Uh, to be sure, there is uh, a lot of work on this theme that are not necessarily friendly to indigenous thinking. Uh, uh, and that is uh, precisely why um, I hope to put uh, them in conversation uh, with uh, Indigenous knowledge and world making practices. Okay. Navigating between two computers. Uh, Uh, so today I'll just provide a very general overview of a few things that I've been working on. Uh, first, I'll talk about the role of biodiversity conservation uh, in state making and territorialization, um, as well as the dispossession of indigenous people uh, in the Himalayas. Then I'll share some reflections on the politics of translating nature culture uh, between conservation science policy and indigenous uh, knowledge uh, systems or relational ontologies. Finally, I'll end uh, with some examples of indigenous environmental governance in Tolpo as a way to uh, go beyond state-centered hegemonic environmental management schemes and highlight place-based plural knowledges and environmental management practices. Um, Before jumping into the overview, um, here are two maps that helps us to situate uh, in Tolpo in Northwest Nepal. Uh, the artistic map provides a stunning portrait of human, non-human and more than human geographies uh, center on Buddhist sense of place. Uh, Tolpo here is to the Southwest of Ganremurche uh, Kailash in, uh, um, uh, in Northwest Nepal. The map on top left shows Tolpa district where Tolpo is located in the administrative uh, division of Nepal, uh, which is covered by Kiapoksundo National Park in two shades of green. Um, also a quick note on the use of the term indigenous, which I conceptualize as um, neither an essential quality nor constructed solely for uh, instrumental benefits, as some would argue, uh, but rather as a contingent politics of positioning uh, within particular uh, political conjunctures, contexts, and discourses. Um, uh, for instance, uh, despite their enrollment into the list of 59 indigenous nationalities of Nepal in 2002, uh, Tolpopa Abdo Tarap uh, have rarely taken up the term until 2014, uh, when state violence and expropriation of caterpillar fungus motivated them to articulate their claims in relation to and in reference 
uh, to uh, in national laws and international uh, human rights standards concerning uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, first, uh, I would like to share the findings of a research paper that was um, uh, that came out as online first. Um, this work is based on both short-term ethnographic field research and uh, longer-term personal engagements uh, in Tolpo and provides a historical and political ecological analysis of participative conservation. Specifically, the paper showed the ways in which participative conservation which has been uh, celebrated as a progressive change to legacies of fortress conservation, uh, how that actually served as a mechanism for the state to exercise its authority over a bounded space um, by controlling natural resources, uh, reordering social natural relations, um, and disarticulating indigenous people from their land-based relationships um, and removing their sovereignty over collective land, including caterpillar fungus. Environmental management uh, therefore constitute the state itself insofar as it helps the state to assert and maintain um, its authority by uh, reordering territories and resource use practices, um, which um, often occurs through the use of violence. In the context of Nepal, protected areas uh, literally occupy more than 80% of its Himalayan region. Uh, to simplify a much more complex uh, issue, uh, international conservation agenda have allowed the Nepali state to territorialize its peripheral, peripheral spaces and secure its borders during a geopolitically uncertain period. Um, and so I'm talking about post 1960s um, uh, yeah, and especially in the 1970s. Uh, this has been experienced as the extension of national park jurisdiction over and severe restrictions on access to resources for local communities. Uh, this is most dramatically illustrated by the contestations over the control of caterpillar fungus in Todara Valley, which I will uh, uh, um, talk next. Here is a graphic of a timeline that shows a selection of uh, historical events that are relevant to caterpillar fungus management um, in the valley. So in the 1960s, uh, the Nepali government carried out, carried out systematic border demarcations, which entailed the beginning of centralized control and the end of local political autonomy within distinct enclaves um, in these regions. The rise of global conservation movement in the 1970s pushed the state to create national parks, including Hyalpoksundo National Park in Tolpo in 1984. Although the collection and trade of caterpillar fungus began um, in the early to mid 1990s, it was legalized only in 2001. Soon after the Mao's insurgents um, started collecting revenues from harvesters and traders to fund its war. Although Tolpupa governed the fungus on their own for nearly a decade, which I'll talk um, about later, uh, this model of resource extraction was eventually taken up by the uh, National Park, which now exclusively controls the fungus and the revenues thus generated. The park claims uh, to redistribute 30 to 50 percent uh, of the revenues uh, per its own policy, uh, but the uh, table on the bottom uh, right uh, uh, tells a completely different story. Um, and here uh, it's not even 30% uh, most of the time. So this historical process and, and patterns therefore demonstrate how environmental management projects uh, can dispossess indigenous peoples from their resources like the caterpillar fungus, and more importantly, their capacity to self-govern in the context of intensifying state presence and power. Uh, so what, what do I mean by indigenous environmental governance? Um, I'm uh, here referring to both historical and contemporary institutions and place-based practices that informs how people understand and interact with the environment, both humans and the non and non-humans. Uh, the case of Tasung uh, Choling Monastery in uh, Cho Village uh, is a good example of indigenous and community conservation that stands in contrast to uh, state-led biodiversity conservation programs. 
uh, Tso residents attribute the establishment of the 600 years old uh, Tasung Soling Monastery to its primary goal of prohibiting hunting. So the picture um, there uh, shows Tasung on the edge of the fox in the lake. Uh, it is said that in former times, hunters would gather, uh, um, would corner their game at the spot where the monastery currently um, stands, which is uh, the last accessible stretch uh, off the shore before it ends in a rocky cliff. Um, Tasung can be literally translated as protecting the edge um, of the lake. Tai in Tibetan um, also refers to a geographical trap in the context of hunting, usually rocky cliffs where hunters uh, corner wild animals using um, hunting dogs before they kill them. Uh, and Shung means uh, protection. As the story goes, uh, hunting was rampant in the area uh, prior to the establishment of the monastery. Recognizing this, uh, Tetan Tsawang the first, uh, the first Pempo uh, Lama of the village, established the monastery in order to prohibit hunting, not just on the current location, but also in the entire territory where the monastery held uh, religious and political authority. The story of Tasung Tsoling Monastery is not alone, and it speaks to the broader practice of um, what is sometimes called Rikya Lungya Tamba, um, which is uh, institutional practice of pro prohibiting wildlife um, um, hunting in and beyond uh, Tolpo. Uh, the Tanka portrait, for example, um, on the right from uh, early 17th century illustrated another instance where monastics um, in Tolpo played a crucial role in prohibiting hunting within their territories. And so here, two lamas from uh, Dotarab and uh, Parpong um, uh, are requesting a royal decree um, to prohibit hunting in their uh, respective territories uh, from the king of Zumla, which uh, at the time held um, political authority over the region. Uh, Tony Hooper uh, called, this, called this practice uh, sealing regulations in his analysis of territorial sealing by Buddhist kings in Tibet since at least the 12th century uh, when local monasteries were crucial in, uh, in issuing, uh, to issuing and enforcing uh, regulations specifically intended to prevent hunting and fishing in their territory. And so here, rather than um, being merely religious institutions, monasteries were an and, are, uh, and still are central political institutions that govern the conduct of everyday socio-ecological lives in Tibet uh, and the Himalaya. Uh, however, indigenous environmental governance doesn't have to be some ancient, uh, if not anachronistic, systems of governance that predates uh, or are outside of the nation states. Uh, rather, it persists vis-a-vis the state uh, in a manner of a palimpsest. Uh, one example is the community management of caterpillar fungus in Dotara Valley between 2007 and 2014, as uh, shown by the, uh, the green circle in the timeline. When villagers devised a system of governance that is based on Tolpopa conceptions of territory and resource access. They mix religious and secular regulations and follow internal community procedures to collectively determine the opening dates for caterpillar fungus harvest, collection and redistribution of fees from um, harvesters from outside, inclusion and exclusion criteria, livestock grazing and waste management among others. This community management was arguably more sustainable than state management uh, systems. And it served to fulfill some crucial development gaps left by the historical um, lack of state-sponsored uh, development in the region. In contrast to the Nepali state's delineation of territory and resource access, the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, used to determine bona fide residency that allowed access to pastures and enjoy benefits from caterpillar fungus revenues were defined in accordance with the customary territorial practice that require allegiance to, uh, for example, uh, uh, to the community um, in the forms of making obligatory um, offerings um, or, or doing chakna uh, chopa and participation in community rituals um, such as nyungne at the village monasteries. This form of indigenous environmental governance is neither outside nor inside the state. Um, rather, um, I argue they simultaneously constitute and exceed the state. For one, uh, the, uh, uh, the Dodara residents um, here collected fees from harvesters from outside the valley uh, through a local NGO that was registered with the government. 
Additionally, its implementation was on several occasions um, supported by Nepal police officers stationed temporarily uh, in the valley during uh, the caterpillar fungus season. Moreover, so some community members uh, also work as park representatives uh, collecting fees on their behalf um, alongside the community members. These multiple and contradictory actions of Tolpopa community members, as well as state actors, such as the police officers, shows how indigenous environmental governance uh, both engage and challenge the state, um, uh, which is in turn formed in such moments of collaboration and conflict. Uh, I would like to end uh, with some reflection on the politics of translating nature culture between conservation science policy and uh, indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, to, th to do that, I want to share a personal story um, as a way to frame the tension when uh, conservation science meets um, indigenous, re indigenous relational ontologies. Um, so, so I'm one of the first generation from my area to go to formal school where I first came across the English word uh, nature as a part of two events um, at the school, uh, the establishment of an eco club by the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and a junior ranger training program through the Partnership for Biodiversity Conservation uh, program, both funded by different agencies of the US government. As a part of the Eco Club events, we cleaned rivers and settlements, uh, dock uh, uh, garbage dumping sites, held rallies, and prepared artistic post uh, posters, um, such as the one in the slide. Uh, but one that I really remember uh, uh, goes something like this um, Save nature, save uh, culture, save Tolpo. The Junior Ranger uh, program attempted to replicate the same program from American National Park Services, um, and according to their program manager in the uh, uh, in Tolpo, the original plan was to uh, have the American Peace Corps volunteers supervise it. However, the Maui insurgency um, had deterred an American presence at the time, uh, so the program instead. Uh, proposed to bring the national park to the classroom um, uh, um, through weekly classes uh, where our teachers uh, talked about the importance of protecting nature, which we understood included things like rivers, mountains, uh, air, plants, blue ship, and most importantly, the snow leopard. This non-human uh, nature was constructed, uh, constructed as existing out there uh, in spectac spectacular landscape like national parks, WWF therefore funded student excursions to Hilpoksundo National Park in the district itself, um, as well as to Chitwan and Bardia National Park in southern Nepal uh, to see uh, this nature and learn about the importance of conservation. Uh, prior, so prior to these events at the school, I had learned about nature in different ways. Um, it was more about relationships between human and other than human uh, beings. Uh, my knowledge of nature was shaped by storytelling, communal rituals, um, and uh, land-based practices that evoked a range of animals and more than uh, human beings, including uh, Lu um, and a range of territorial deities. Uh, this conception of nature as shaped by the stories, rituals, and practices was thus um, at odds with the conception of nature um, uh, that was taught by the Eco Club and Junior Ranger programs. Uh, in this particular case, conservation science conveniently ignores alternative conceptions of nature and, uh, and in fact attempts to displace them. But there has also been attempts to incorporate indigenous knowledge into conservation science policy um, uh, in Tolpo itself. Um, the F's Plant and People's Initiative, which collaborated with AMCHI, um, is an example. Uh, but the collaboration was only uh, 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 in the capacity um, um, the, but, but the collaboration with the AMCHIs was only in the capacity of their knowledge of plants, uh, rather than as um, a householder, priest, and, and medical uh, practitioners. 
Of course, such a partial incorporation of indigenous knowledge and knowledge holders as they are deemed fit within a scientific framework is a common issue that emerge whenever environmental co-management frameworks uh, turn to indigenous uh, knowledge. Uh, what is at stake, um, and this has been pointed out by uh, Dr. Pasang Yanzi as well, is the politics of framing, which I understand to be the need to treat um, these forms of indigenous knowledge on their own terms uh, and in the cultural context of their emergence. Uh, one way, of course, is to foreground and bring more stories of, of, of indigenous relational ontologies. Um, and um, hopefully I have... Uh, done a little bit of that um, um, as part of the presentation. Uh, yet the practical question uh, remains, and I, I guess this is a, a, a question I want to leave with. Um, how can environmental science and management projects um, incorporate indigenous knowledge in ways uh, that do justice to the voices of both humans and more than human beings? Um, uh, thank you, and I look forward to the discussions afterwards. Uh, thank you so much, Purwa. Um for sharing your important work. I think this gives us a lot to think about in terms of indigenous versus state versions of conservation and environmental knowledge, and also the politics of knowledge and what is at stake for local communities. And uh, you leave us with a really uh, important question that I hope we can talk a little bit about in the discussion. Um, so our, our next presenter is Dr. Hong Nguyen, uh, he is a postdoctoral research scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. Uh, his research focuses on understanding hydroclimatic variability and changes at multiple timescales over the past millennium and applying this knowledge to water resource management. Um, he's conducted research in Thailand, Pakistan, the Philippines, as well as over the whole monsoon Asia. He's now exploring applications of dendrochronology to understanding long-term hydroclimatic changes on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, he's been teaching a collaborative, a collaborative um, pilot course with the Modern Tibetan Studies Program at Columbia, looking at conventional historical archives and tree ring data to explore the relationships between past, uh, past climates and environmental histories um, on the Tibetan Plateau. So, um, we will hear from him about that class. His talk is uh, called Climate History of the Tibetan Plateau, the Joint Exploration with Students. Um, and so please welcome uh, Dr. Nguyen. All right. Um, thank you, Evelyn, for the introduction and um, many thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, I'm a climate scientist and I haven't really worked a lot on Tibet. I, I've actually Explore, start exploring uh, research on the Tibet, Tibetan Plateau um, at the end of last year. So I'm very honored to um, be sharing with you what I've been working on in a, in, uh, in a short time frame. Um, so I'm a tree ring scientist and I, and I work with trees and I love trees because trees are, to me, trees are time machines. They are, they, they, they re they are excellent records of the climate of the past. Uh, and they, they do that via the annual rings that they have. So um, they form a ring every every year. And so you probably remember from biology classes in secondary school that by counting the rings, you know how old the tree is. But trees tell us more than just their age, because if you notice the, the, the size of the rings are not the same. Some of the rings are quite big and some of the rings are quite small. And the width of the ring corresponds to climate um if a tree lives in a cold place um the big rings would correspond to warm years and the cold ring the, the the narrow rings would correspond to dry years and if a tree is in a warm place but but have a distinct wet and dry season distinct um, um wet phase and cold phase in, in the climate then the rings will correspond to how wet or how dry a year is if it's a big ring you have a wet year I mean, if it's a cold ring a narrow ring it's a it's a dry year um so so that with that knowledge if we can measure the width of every individual ring from a tree and you do that for many many trees and you do that for many many for many places then you can reconstruct the climate of the past and so i, I want to showcase a, a, a particular case example of uh, how useful tree rings can be in 
revealing the, the, the history of the past. And so in that case study is um, set in the Angkor, uh, in the Khmer Kingdom, circa in the 10, 15, 10 to 15th century. So on, the, on this map on the left, you see the map of Southeast Asia in the year 900 CE. And this is the Khmer Kingdom and Angkor was the capital of the Khmer Kingdom. Um, at that time, Angkor was one of the biggest population center of the world with the population uh, nearly somewhere near a million. And, and remember, this is the year 900 CE. And that's, so that is really huge. Um, but by the, by the 15th century, Angkor was abandoned. Uh, the Khmer Kingdom uh, relocated the, the capital to another city. So the question was, why was Angkor abandoned? And uh, there was a lot of, uh, there are many theories as to what was the cause. Um, there were invasions from Ayutthaya from, uh, and there are many other factors, political factors, but one hypothesis was that maybe climate was a factor. And using tree rings, uh, climate scientists were able to reconstruct um, the history of the soil moisture in the region. And that reconstruction is called the Monsoon Asia Atlas. And this is, this is something that's gonna, re, that's gonna come back several times in today's talk. So the MADA is a three, you can imagine the MADA as a three-dimensional data set. It has longitude, latitude, and the value for soil moisture at that longitude, latitude over time. So if you, if you calculate the average uh, soil moisture over the 14th century and over the 15th century, uh, we realize that there are two uh, major droughts that happen over Southeast Asia. And these are, these are the anchor droughts one and anchor drought two, and uh, with evidence from uh, archaeological records, historical records. And now with evidence from tree rings, um, we know that these droughts, in other words, climate was a contributing factor to the demise of the uh, making them of Angkor as a city. So that was a case study that showed how useful tree ring can be. But this is actually an idealized case study. Most of the time, uh, we do not have a beautiful uh, case study, a beautiful result like this, because most of the time, we climate scientists do our, do our tree ring reconstruction, and then we have a time series we have what happened in the past, but we have nothing to compare to because we don't have any historical, historical records to compare. And so I am particularly interested in how we can compare or combine, or rather combine natural archives, which are tree rings and other climate proxies with written archives, which is historical text, uh, local records and so on. If we can combine these two archives together, then we have a complete history of climate wind and, and we can understand how human impact climate and how climate impact human and so on. Um, but turns out that's not um, an easy thing to do because historians and climate scientists for most of, for most of our lives work in separate disciplines and we don't talk together that much. Um, and that's something that um, me and my colleagues at Weatherhead want to change. Um, um, we tried, we, we wonder how historians and climate scientists can sit to, can talk, uh, can um, join force. So naturally one way to do that is by conversations. Um, we sit down together with climate scientists who say, okay, here are the data that we have. Um, here are the records that we have and the historians, okay, here are all the historical texts that we have and we exchange and we exchange our knowledge and we share what happened. We share what we know about what happened in the past and we can try to see whether any relationship between climate and uh, society. Um, so that's that's one way we can do, uh, but my colleague Ray Tato at uh, Weatherhead has an even better idea. He said, he said, okay, let's do it with our students. Let's just not do it alone. Um, so I would like to uh, say kudos to my colleague Gray, Lauren, and Pardon. Um, Gray and Pardon um, wrote, a, wrote an amazing proposal to um, produce a new, to offer a new course in uh, the Modern Tibetan Study Program. And Lauren, being the director of the program, is very supportive of having this uh, materialized. So 
in this new class is a class of the climate history on the Tibet, on the Tibetan plateau. But but then me as a paleo climate climate scientist will come in and talk about paleo climate data. So the challenge for me is then how to teach climate data analytics to history students. Uh, the, when when I first came to the class and they say, "Hey, I'm gonna teach you R. I'm gonna teach you data analytics," the first reaction that I got is, mm. uh, scary," because, um, yeah, these students, most of them don't have any experience with coding or data analysis. Uh, some of them do, uh, but most don't. So how how do I how do I teach uh, this? Note, note that this is a history history class, so I do not have the whole semester to teach uh, R or to teach uh, programming or anything. I have very limited time, basically I have one lecture, two hours, and several office hours after that. Um, so how do, so how, how do I approach that? Um, the, my approach is then uh, a little bit different. Instead of teaching them how to program, I prepare a set of code that does a, a standard analysis. And then my challenge for the student is then to modify the code and get new results. So for example, here I have a piece of R code that get the MADA data and filter time. So get the data that is in this particular period between 1756 and 1768 CE and plot that on a map. And so on that map, what I'm showing is the soil moisture record in the, on the Tibetan plateau over this period. And on this map, blue means wet and red means dry. So this period was relatively wet on the Tibetan plateau. Now, but this is a period I, that I chose at random. May not have, it may not have anything to do with history. If a student is interested in a particular period in history, they may choose to plot a different period. So all they have to do is to change the year right here. So if they if they change the year to a different period and run the code again, they immediately have a new map and they can do it with any other period that they want in, that they are interested in. So the idea is now we have a very flexible assignment for the student. They can do the bare minimum for, for those who, is, who, who are not well-versed in coding, they can do the bare minimum, which is just change the year or change the coordinates, or, to, or just change the coordinates of the data and plot the map for different regions over different times, time scale to explore what happened over the past 1,000 years over, over different uh, sub-regions on the Tibetan plateau. But if they are more, but if they are more um, inclined to do coding, they, they want to dive more. Yes, they can, they can, they can, with coding, they can do a lot more than just change the year, or just change the coordinates. They can add new data set in, for example, uh, historical data set of uh, monasteries, for example, if they add all that in, they have new results um, that is, that go beyond the bare minimum. So, so it's up to the students who, to do whichever level that they are comfortable with. And so that's, that's my approach. Um, now, what happens if they can't run code at all? I have a playground for them, and that playground is an app that I wrote. It's called the uh, Mother Explorer. So here's the hyperlink. If you click on this link, it's going to bring you to a website. Um, now, this is a prototype that I wrote in two hours, so it's not perfect. It sometimes doesn't run, sometimes give an error. I admit it's a prototype, but... Um, what they can do is they can simply slide this uh, slider and as they do that they will see the the map on the right change so they can explore individual year um, or they can choose a, a multi-year average for example if you want to look at what happened in tibet between 1500 and 1550 you can just key in the year and the, and the map will show them the average of what happened in that year so this is a playground for them to explore. Uh, even, even if they don't want to do any coding, they can just go to this playground and explore what's happened in Asia in the last 1,000 years. So with that, I thought I was able to generate some interest. Um, what I'm 
what, what I find most uh, su surprising <laughs> was that my colleague Gray was the one who was actually most uh, active in running code and he, he gave me a PDF of 20 different maps that he made. Um, it's, it's like, it's as, as if he were one of the students in the class, it uh, makes me really happy. Um, okay, so that's my approach. Uh, does it work? Uh, I'm gonna highlight with you some findings, uh, something that I've been working with the students uh, over the past semester. Um, so I want to highlight the, particularly the work of my of one of the students in class, Yam So. Uh, she's um, she's one of the students who is more familiar with uh, data analysis and coding. So she wanted to analyze um, monastery data. So this is a, a map, and I show and I show her how to make this interactive map. It's actually just five lines of code. Uh, if you have the data, it's, it's actually just five lines of code. And so this is the map of the of where the monasteries are in on the Tibetan plateau and um, if you click on them you can see the name of the monastery and the year they are founded and, and you can see the distribution of the time where each of them is uh, was built and then if you plot the number of new monasteries over time then you have this graph over here and you start to notice something initially there were very few new monasteries but then around the year 1000 onwards you started to have a new monastery built almost every year. Uh, the year 1050 in particular is the year that, that has the most monasteries built in the entire history, more than 17 monasteries built in that one single year. So maybe, maybe just maybe the climate in this period has something that helped with the development of monastery. So now with the knowledge that you have about the coding, you can just go back to the code and again, just change the year. And so now we, we, you plot the, the climate history of the Tibetan plateau between uh, 1040 and 1070 CE, then you start to notice, okay, it was a wet period. The climate was fav favorable to pasture, uh, to, for pastoralists, um, favorable, favorable for grazing. And so maybe that helps with the, um, uh, with the new, with the development of new monasteries. So maybe, so this is of course just an initial exploration. We, we, we need to do a lot more investigation. For example, I just learned today from the previous speaker from Puwa that a monastery was built to control the harvest, uh, to control um, pastoralization. And if may, it, it may not be affected by climate. I, so. Of course, this is just an initial exploration, but I hope that by combining climate data and historical data and geographical data, we may be arriving at something interesting in the near future. Uh, yeah, so what's next? As the students will have their final presentation next Thursday. So yeah, if this, this seminar was like two weeks later, I would be able to share a lot more about the students' results, but, um, but I think with the highlight of the work from Yum, so I think, um, it's enough to show to show that okay, this is an idea that's maybe working. In the summer, I think Lauren is planning to do a lot of summer readings on the historical text. And uh, as I said, the I, the goal is to have paleo climate data plus geographical data plus historical plus historical document to gain insight. So with that, last October we submitted a proposal to the National Science Foundation to the NSF um, HEX program um, to to do just that. And why we are interested in doing that because climate change is happening. Uh, on the right, I'm showing the monthly and annual temperature at Lhasa in Tibet, and you can see very clearly the warming trend towards the last two decades. Much and, and Tibet, the Tibetan plateau is warming very fast, as is other regions in the world due to climate change, and so if we have a better picture of the climate of the past we will understand bet, bet, much better what, what is natural and therefore what is not natural that is, that is caused by human and that we hope will be more useful for um, managing the natural resources and, help, and, and helping the life of uh, the people on the Tibetan plateau. Yeah, so with that, uh, that's all I have. Um, if you have want to find out more about what we're doing, here's my contact and uh, please feel free to reach out.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Hung. Uh, it's so exciting to see even the um, kind of initial findings that you are seeing from your interdisciplinary course, um, and we look forward to hearing more. Um, so our final panelist is uh, Dr. Pasang Yangji Sherpa. Uh, she is an assistant professor of Lifeways in Indigenous Asia, jointly appointed in the Department of Asian Studies and Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Her research areas include the Sherpa diaspora, human dimensions of climate change, and ind indigeneity in Nepal and the Himalayas. She uses ethnographic methods to study everyday concerns of Him um, Himalayan people in order to normalize their experiences and represent uh, Himalayan communities as equal partners in decision-making spaces. This has led her to engage with academic and non-academic communities through writings, teaching, and conversations. Um, She's previously taught at the New School in New York, Pacific Lutheran University, Penn State University, Washington State University, and University of Washington. And her interviews have appeared in Alpinist, Al Jazeera, BBC, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and more. Um, she's going to talk to us today about indigenous environmental justice in Nepal. So please um, join me in welcoming her. Pasang, are you um, able to sh share your screen? Or did we lose her? Oh, I guess she's having some technical issues right now. So um, maybe let's hang tight for a minute. Hi, Doctor. Um, would you maybe like to answer some of the questions for a moment while we hang tight, or what do you think would be more preferable? Yeah, actually, there were um, there was a specific question for Doctor Nguyen regarding um, uh, his data. Let me try to find it. So, uh, by from from Tenzin Yankee, uh, what is the data resolution for Mata dataset, and are there any other data sets we can explore? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. The MADA is one degree by one degree. Uh, each grid cell is one degree by one degree. Um, there are several other reconstructions of past climate. Most of them are individual points, not, not the whole region, but individual locations. Uh, and um, there is a really reconstruction of precipitation of, over the same region uh, as well. And in the NSF proposal that uh, Dre, Lauren, and I are working, are working on, we propose to produce new reconstruction. So hopefully that will be useful in the future if we get funded. Okay, thank you. Um, and while we wait for Pasanla to reconnect, um, there's a question from Nima Gurung to Porwala. Um, so I think you can see the question on the chat box too. Um, Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you, Nima, for the question. And um, uh, yeah, it's a great question. And um, conservation uh, uh, efforts in uh, places like Tolpo uh, has, um, from the beginning to today, uh, it's very much, uh, uh, small effort is very much part of the conservation. Um, so protecting uh, an iconic uh, species. Um, and that is, um, to me, a, a, a quite a problematic, um, uh, given, uh, you know, my, our own, my experience as, as a herder uh, at some point, uh, uh, but also looking at sort of bigger picture of how snow leopard figure in, uh, in people's life. Um, and so it's much more complicated than uh, people uh, just uh, revenge killing snow leopard. Uh, and so therefore needing to be educated. Um, and so that that is pretty much... Um, um, I think what the, the what the uh, snow leopard conservation is into. Um, in fact, just a few days ago, um, snow leopard ran into the house um, of uh, of uh, of a neighbor um, and killed uh, several goats and so on. Um, and so there is this severe uh, there is complete lack of uh, um, 
I mean, there, there, there is some emerging ones, but but not much compensation programs from from the, uh, these conservation projects. So, um, if anything, uh, one way that snow leopard could be protected is um, is to have better um, compensation uh, projects that uh, compensate pe ordinary people who lose their livelihood, um, and rather than. Uh, blaming them for killing snow leopard um, and 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 so focusing on that part. Um, so that that is in short, um, I think an issue with uh, with how global conservation uh, sort of selectively uh, chooses one species um, and implements its project um, often uh, without uh, listening to uh, people who have a much deeper uh, understanding of these um, animals and wildlife and, and have a, a longer relationship with them, which is much more complicated than, than uh, conflict uh, with them. Okay, I, thank you, Perwala, and also uh, Hong. Um, I think we have uh, Pasang back with us now. So before she, if uh, so, while we still have her, just in case her technology uh, does not work for long, let's um, have her present. So she's presenting um, on indigenous environmental justice in Nepal. Hi everyone, this is today. Um, I'm not sure what's wrong with the internet on campus here at UBC today. So I'm actually. Um, uh, using my phone to connect with you, which means I won't have the beautiful slides I had prepared for you. And um, we'll just have to do with uh, the uh, with just my image um, here on Zoom. But I do want to thank the organizers for inviting me and opening this space for this wonderful conversation. And um, it is really uh, my pleasure to um, I should say this is the first time I'm presenting with Purva Dundup, so I'm, uh, that's particularly um, exciting for me, and I'm um, so happy uh, we had this opportunity this morning to um, present together. Um, and that being said, I also um, am very grateful for the presentation um, Dr. Nguyen uh, just uh, delivered. So it is my pleasure to discuss uh, today how transdisciplinary approaches are crucial to our understanding of climate change in Tibetan and Himalayan regions and contribute to our knowledge of global climate change and uh, community resilience. So um, a lot of you are, are uh, I'm not sure uh, many of you, but uh, at least I, I know some of you in the audience um, are familiar with my work. So some of the things I'm presenting today are going to be uh, things I have presented or written about elsewhere. So you will see uh, a lot of uh, resemblance there. But what I really tried to do uh, with my talk today is pull together different materials from different places over the years that I've worked with um, to think about transdiscipl uh, transdisciplinary approaches and really how um, it's not um, uh, to, to really emphasize that uh, in order to address the challenges we face today of um, climate change and um, just resilience in this time of climate and nature emergency, I think it's really, really important to think in a interdisciplinary um, and I would even say transdisciplinary uh, approach. Um, and in all of this, um, I believe that it's very important that we uh, take, um, we not forget the people and we take a people-centered approach in our uh, work. So, uh, uh, to begin um, the talk, um, I want to share uh, with you something I published with my colleague Rithodi Chakravarti um, uh, more than a year ago. So in our co-authored paper titled uh, From Climate Adaptation to Climate Justice, Critical Reflections on the IPCC and Himalayan Climate Knowledges, I contributed a section titled Researchers Come, in quote, Researchers Come, Ask Questions and Leave. Uh, extractive methodologies, community aspirations, and the politics of knowledge. And so I, I wanted to include that here um, in, our talk, in my talk today because I wanted to show what living with climate change can entail for indigenous communities of high Asia. So it's not just dealing with the physical changes that are happening in the environment, but also um, dealing with the institutional and knowledge uh, systems that um, 
uh, are in our lives. So although the amount of attention for external interventions uh, Sherpas in Mount Everest region receive is on a different scale, the ways in which the Sherpas are treated are not unlike other Himalayan communities when it comes to talking about climate change, especially in a research and policy uh, space. So in Northeast uh, Nepal, Mount Everest region attracts tens of thousands of tourists every year. Um, uh, I believe um, almost anyone here uh, can say, uh, would know that. So it also attracts researchers pursuing different scientific projects from Himalayan glacial melt to Sherpa genetic makeup to the impact of tourism on the local community. And it's very interesting to see what kinds of research is uh, being published uh, at the moment, and also this increasing surge in climate focused, uh, climate change focused research uh, that are happening. So when researchers, uh, yeah, so, uh, when researchers come, middle-aged male hotel owners living on the main trail to Mount Everest, like Dawa, who I quote here, are invited to participate in various formal activities, including meetings and knowledge sharing workshops. Researchers communicate and engage community members in ways that are similar to the development and conservation practitioners that frequent the region. So in 2011, when I asked Dawa what he thinks about the researchers, he said quite bluntly, they come, ask questions, and leave. They make money and never return. Researchers are just useless. Dawa's words of irritation rolled out of his tongue with ease, unguarded during a casual conversation about climate change research I was interested in. And although his statement was not directly pointed at me, like many researchers he knew, I was asking questions, recording interviews, and taking notes for months without a visible, tangible, and immediate benefit to the local people. But I was also a fellow villager, somebody he knew personally. His words did not surprise me, and it was not the first or the last time I heard someone complain about the researcher type folks. So in 2018, a woman, for, a woman from a village north of Dawas shared that the villagers openly questioned the, the intentions of the researchers who were hosting a lunch meeting to share their findings, and the villagers mentioned that it was not apparent why they should care about the things the researchers were sharing. They were tired of seeing one group after another sharing findings about things that did not seem immediately relevant to them. So several glacial uh, climate, um, uh, several glacial studies have been conducted here for decades in the Mount Everest region in Kumbu and Farah. Between 2004 and 2011, when I was doing my doctoral research and documenting that time period, um, between 2004 and 2011, numerous climate change related institutional activities were organized in the Everest region from the Nepali government's cabinet meeting to draw international attention to the melting Himalayas to a foot race to show that even the fastest runner will not be able to outrun the potential India Glacial Lake outburst flood. So one of the most critically, um, uh, one of the uh, glacial lakes that's identified as being the most critical ones in the um, Himalayan region. So in a BBC report, Ang Chiri Sherpa, uh, chairman of, a, of an association of tourism entrepreneurs in Pangbache and Dingbache, villages next to the critical in Jacho, said, every time we begin to for, forget about the threats from glacial lake outbursts, then comes news of yet another study through the radio and television. And this has been happening over and over again for more than 15 years now. Instead of having to fear death like that again and again, we, should, we would rather die once if the lake really bursts out one day." End quote. So, Nearly 10 years after I had begun my ethnographic study of climate change in the Nepali Himalayas, the first of its kind regional climate assessment report was published. Uh, it was followed by the IPCC special report on the oceanic and cryosphere change in 2019. And both of these reports showed that the melting of Himalayan glaciers was happening at a rate faster than previously estimated. In order to further discussions of the changing Himalayan cryosphere, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, ECMOD, organized an international conference of experts and stakeholders in Kathmandu later that year. An elected official from Langtang, a high mountain region, listed the environmental changes his community has been noticing. 
and his speech in Nepali translated into English highlighted how Kathmandu-based experts visit the region, write their reports based on limited stay and bring solutions to problems that do not necessarily fit local conditions or are effective in the long run. The next day, a professional cheesemaker from the same village echoed the official's remarks and underscored the need for proper consultation with the villagers. So he also pointed out, uh, speaking in Nepali, that although he may not have an official university certificate, his long-term knowledge of the local environment is based on meticulous lifelong observation, first as a pastoralist and later as a cheesemaker. And when the event concluded, on my way home, a fellow Nepali participant confessed with embarrassment that she did not know what cryosphere really meant. And she was not alone. However, many participants, including senior officials at the conference were frank about not fully understanding what cryosphere implied. As participants shared their experiences and observations from the high mountains, they were also learning and engaging with a new term that was gaining currency in framing international climate change science. So the same place many people have called home for generations now had a new name, cryosphere. At the heart of these recurring remarks in my ethnographic notes is the hierarchical approach with which urban experts have engaged the rural locals. Uh, even when community participation is emphasized in research projects, it takes the form of delivering the results um, to passive recipients at the back end rather than identifying problems with active stakeholders to address them together. The researchers sharing their findings in the field and consulting local communities, as illustrated by the conference in Kathmandu, show that efforts have been made to create platforms to share voices, to be inclusive. However, as we see here, the need for a relational and reciprocal exchange instead of a short-term fix, uh, technical fix, persists. Whereas the necessity for scientific research, especially in the context of climate change, cannot be overstressed. And so uh, in my presentation, I want to uh, be very clear that I'm not dismissing the, um, uh, uh, the value, the significance of uh, uh, the climate change science as we understand it, of it now, uh, but really, I want to uh, emphasize that it is crucial that our research projects recognize its extractive nature that is palpable for those experiencing it in the field. And Dawa's words are a sharp reminder of that and the work of repairing broken trust that remains. So here, the diagnosis for the Mount Everest region is not really a lack of scientific study. In fact, uh, it, if you just do a simple Google uh, Scholar search, you come up with hundreds, um, if not thousands of scientific studies um, that pertain to Sherpas or the Mount Everest region. So it's not the lack of scientific study, but the approach with which uh, scientific studies are conducted and who counts and whose knowledge system matters. These are the kinds of questions we need to be addressing and building trust takes time and effort. So for the rest of my talk, I want to um, highlight or um, uh, invite, welcome, a new beginning. So in light of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC assessment reports and regional assessment report that I mentioned earlier, uh, which have shown that warming in the Himalayas have occurred at a rate and scale more intense than what had been previously predicted, there is no question that sustainability of indigenous peoples in the Himalayas is at stake. The global pandemic has further exposed uh, the socioeconomic vulnerabilities through, throughout the Himalayas, and this is also the case of the residents in the Mount Everest region. So I speak today of a new beginning for climate change research in our homelands, whether it is the Himalayas or the Tibetan Plateau, however you want to, um, uh, you see it, uh, welcoming a decolonial approach. I pose the following questions to anyone invested in the topic um, of climate change and um, the region to reflect upon. Whose livability are we concerned about? And who gets to decide what livability is for the residents of the Himalayas or Tibetan Plateau? 
Our collective climate change studies have not sufficiently equipped thus far the researchers in adequately addressing climate change effects or the communities with reliable and useful resources or the policymakers with ethical pathways for a livable future. The scope and gravity of the climate change reality require us to break the cycle of what Chakravarti et al. Um, calls dis disciplinary chauvinism in the Himalayan context and what Oza et al. calls, um, in quote, technocratic control of climate change adaptation policymaking in Nepal. Our research, uh, so uh, our research will continue to fall short in its aspirational impact on the field of study and importantly for the communities on the front lines of climate change if we continue to ignore the contributions of various epistemologies to our understanding of climate change. And if we do not take the time to collaborate with knowledge producers, co-producing knowledge from uh, with uh, different ontological traditions as equal partners. So I, I acknowledge all of this in my talk today, not to deter us, uh, but to readjust our focus on ethical pathways communities are already navigating through networks of care and what Kyle White calls epistemology of coordination. So in his chapter titled Against a Crisis Epistemology, he argues that, in quote, um, he argues that epistemologies of crisis allow for unjust and violent responses to the urgency and newness of crisis presentation. This perspective challenges the newness of the climate change crisis for indigenous peoples. His words remind us to pay attention to the many injustices we already live with, the many crises that already define us, and our lived experiences across continents in North America, here where Kyle White is from, and Asia are different. However, the crisis narrative attached with the global phenomenon of climate change that affects our collective present and future makes wise work worth exploring in the Tibetan uh, and Himalayan context. So he argues for epistemologies of coordination, ways of knowing the world that emphasizes the moral bonds of kinship relationships for generating the responsible capacity to respond to constant change. The climate emergency we are living today is defined by such constant change, unprecedented, unpredictable change. And the adaptation that is required of our bodies, our families, and our communities. And it is only through the moral bonds of kinship relationships that we will be able to generate the responsible capacity to respond, to live through multiple deaths. So I want to um, end my talk by bringing three other um, scholars. Uh, actually, bringing two other scholars. The first one, uh, Zoe Todd. So in advancing discussions of charismatic meta categories um, uh, in her uh, in Reddy's uh, quoting, uh, referring to Reddy, Zoe Todd talks about how, like the Anthropocene, through uh, the charismatic meta categories, like the Anthropocene, through writing and thinking about the climate, ontologies, and our shared engagements with the world, um, Todd argue, has argued that it is important to be aware of competing or similar discourses happening outside the rock star arenas of Euro Western thought. Um, Todd shares her learnings from mentors like Tracy Lindbergh and pre legal scholar Van Napoleon that, in quote, Reciprocity, love, accountability, and care are tools we require to face uncertain futures and the end of worlds as we know them, end quote. She adds that, end quote, um, indeed, this ability to face the past, present, and future with care, tending to relationships with between people, place, and stories will be crucial as we face the challenges of the Anthropocene collectively in our nations, societies, peoples, and in communities around the globe, end quote. So our stamina and the capacity to sustain as people, peoples, uh, depends on our bonds of care. Diane Millian reminds us that caring is anti-capitalist. To quote her, caring builds the trust that creates communities, kinships between responsible, respectful, connected, purposeful beings, we must take care to build relations that indigeneity requires, end quote. 
Um, so I'll stop there. And I, I really want to thank you for listening and uh, for your time today. I would like and would like to uh, leave you uh, with a prayer. So when the fire burns, when the lake floods, when the earth cracks, and when the wind storms, I pray that there is someone to lend you a hand. Thank you so much, Pasanla.